every year in Supercoach, something changes. One year, extra trades. Another year, boosts. This year in the AFL, they've decided to bring in extra buys. We're talking round one and six. It's a doozy. Today, we're joined by JD in the episode of this, well, in this episode of the Beginner Series to talk the early buys, what you guys should do. Stay tuned. JD, thanks for coming on, mate. Um, I missed out last time. You and you and Joe were talking Essendon. I missed out, so I'm glad to have you on. We're talking buy rounds. Uh, I love how you say missed out. Like you would have happily sat there and uh, <laughs> took in Essendon talk for an hour. Like, come on, there's no way. Hey, it's half, a that was a voluntary team. omission. Well, all my ex players are now on your team, so you've got our ex players and the ex coach. Um, I'll have some things to say. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was I was very happy not having you around, Big J. It was definitely uh, we got to speak our mind without any. We don't need any extra forces from outside of the club to, to heaps of extra coal on our heads. We already mm. feel bad enough as it is. So leave us alone in our optimism and pessimism at the same time. It's a very fine line. As is the approach that we are going to take with the buy rounds this year. It's definitely mm-hmm. a new sort of. It's a new predicament that super coaches have not experienced to date, and we thought it would be a great, a great idea, JD, to get you on because your recent video explaining the buys was just so damn good. We thought it would be really important to get you on here to also uh, express those views here in our beginner series, and also that we can help direct people to watch that video because it really was helpful. Well, thank you. It's very nice of you to say. I feel like I've given the wrong impression, though, because I'm no me by no means a buy expert. I'm just trying to navigate it like everyone else and sharing my opinions. If you found them helpful, that's good. But um, I think maybe what we most useful is like actually press pressure testing those ideas and um, figuring out if they actually make sense or if I've kind of yeah mm. made some bad assumptions along the way that are worth revisiting down the track. Yeah. Um, before we kind of go further, what was your kind of initial reaction to the fixture league, you know, with the, the round zero happening and kind of holy moly, what's happening to super coach this year? Uh, yeah. I mean, like I didn't like it. I'm still not a big fan. I think other people have come around to like, go, they've gone through the stages of grief and they've probably hit mm-hmm. acceptance faster than I have. Uh, and I think the fact that there's change, as you kind of alluded to in the intro there, uh, Jay is a positive one for a lot of people it just keeps the game fresh that something's new and different. But yeah. I think we could have made the game fresh and new in a variety of different ways that didn't involve us bringing in round zero. And mm-hmm. I, I think the biggest problem I have with it is just that part of the fun of Supercoach and fantasy, um, for those that play that as well, is going through and making your side in the preseason and actually figuring out all these players, putting in the work to look at preseason games, you know, training reports, all that type of stuff, and figure out who's going to succeed and who isn't. And then obviously trading from then on out. When you have eight teams worth of players nearly half the comp that you get a full game of um Mm. to actually view their real roles their scoring potential in those roles all that type of stuff it takes away a lot of the fun and kind of cheapens the preseason a little bit for mine uh Mm -hmm. which yeah i know other people don't mind that as much but i like i think that's a a bit of a shame it takes away some of the skill that the game had and plays it back into other ways but of course yeah there's there is the new challenge of being able to navigate these buys and what are the strategies that we put in place? And I'm sure we'll pretty quickly figure out what works and what doesn't work this year. And part of the fun is predicting what that will be ahead of time. Yeah, it's definitely not as punishing as probably what we've had in previous years. Because as you say, you get those kind of early looks in and, you know, is this rookie any good? Is this guy playing in this position? You don't need to blindly kind of go into round one without that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think just like as an aside and like, you know, woe is me, like content creator, this is a very niche audience, but... For, for I think us specifically, it does take away some of the fun at looking at those eight teams as well, because at the end of the day, it comes down to, well, it doesn't really matter what we think, like just wait until those teams play in round one, like we, mm. uh, spending the time actually looking into them. It's just like, doesn't feel very rewarding like it uh, used to. And maybe people that are just doing their own research get the same feeling as well, that it's just not as fun researching those teams anymore. But yeah, like, oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. No, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly because I'm looking into a player. And I'm just like, uh, I could just wait a couple of weeks. I just, I could just wait a few weeks and just see round zero. And I know exactly 
how much mid how much mid time Sam Flanders is playing in round zero, for example. All these mid prices who are playing in round zero. So I mean, on one side for the beginner who is watching this video, who probably isn't used to re to doing their own research extensively in the preseason, it definitely is. I know we're complaining about it as content creators and experienced players of the game, but to be completely honest, if you're a beginner coming into this game for the first time, this is probably one of the best handicaps that you can possibly you know uh, that you can possibly have coming into the start of the season. You've been given more trades, you've been given a free look into eight teams, as we've mentioned. And so, if this is your first time playing Super Coach, welcome aboard. It, the stars have absolutely aligned for you. And you really should be coming into this game eyes wide open, really excited. Mate, and they get to watch our beginner series, Joe. So, like, alongside everything, there's five, six episodes of, hey, this is how you play Super Coach. We haven't had this before either. I'm glad you enjoy making these videos so much, Big J. And I really hope the viewers, I really hope the viewers enjoy watching it just as much as we enjoy talking about it. Because here we are. We are starting to talk about the buys think this photo has been making the rounds a bit because it's really handy uh, and very well made. I don't know exactly who made this, but kudos to you, whoever did it, because it is very, very easy to see. And then obviously JD has got a more in-depth one on his video where he even mm -hmm. puts in various rankings uh, and color-coded as well. Very funky. I love seeing that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I did what I normally do, which is take something nerdy and make it even nerdier. So, um, yeah, yep. <laughs> All right, then. Well, when we're talking about our starting teams, uh, as we can see here, we've got the buyers in general. I mean, obviously, starting off right off the bat with the round two buy players. But one of these players that we've had for many years in our forward line is Josh Dunkley. Now, he's not forward eligible anymore, which is very sad for us this year. Uh, I imagine that the buy would play a part in whether or not you pick him or not, just how much of a factor is it in your decision making? Yeah, so uh, I think part of this comes down to what's your philosophy for picking players. And mm -hmm. in the video that you're kind of alluding to, I spend a fair bit of time outlining that I'm looking for players with substantial upside for the most part. So trying to find players that are priced well below what I think they'll average for the year and then loading up on as many of those as I can in my side, which is, to be honest, what most people do. It's just whether mm -hmm. they look for that in the middle of the price range or the it ends with guns and rookies and all that type of stuff. Um, so I think the, the hard part is that when you uh, have a player missing through these buys, if you think about a premium coming out and a rookie coming onto the field to replace them, on any given week, you're probably going to lose 50 to 60 points, something like that. And if you look at those 50 to 60 points over the course of a year or up to the buys, um, it ends up being a, a pretty substantial uh, points per game loss that that player has. So basically by having that early buy, they have inbuilt negative value. They're starting off at a disadvantage to those that might average the same for the same price, but then not have the buy. They, they have a 50 point head start. So what that really means to me is, and especially when it comes to premiums, uh, which I think is where the, this question is starting with at least they have to be like be able to significantly outperform what they're priced at and i also have to believe that there's no other options in their line that could do the same thing otherwise i just pick the the same one without the buy so um yeah it, it gives all these guys a really like fairly large um uh handicap i guess to start the year when it comes to how i assess them and whether or not i'll pick them I mean, it's a really interesting point you make, right? If you're someone that's got two or three of these early buy round players in their midfield, you're really kind of hurting yourself that way. I know, yeah, it's um something that we've toyed around with a little bit with making our teams and how many do we have, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And it kind of follows a little bit onto our next question is how many of these early buy players is too many? Um, should we be aiming for one or two, do you think, in the midfield or is is that too many? Yeah, so there's a couple of different dimensions to pick this apart. So firstly, if you can find lots of these guys that are really good value and you don't see any other value in the line as good as that. So say, for example, Walsh, who's priced at what, like 103 or something like that. 
Um, mm-hmm. Say you've got him pegged at going 120 this year, maybe like an outlandish prediction, but you see him going 17 point upside. He'll be like a top four or five mid at that point. You probably don't have anyone else in your team that looks like that. You should start him. And if you could find another Walsh, like say, um, uh, I'm trying to think of who, who else is a good example. Oh, Green. I oh, know Jack Steele, yeah, was say, sort of say, similar price. Yeah, point. well, but Steele doesn't have the buy. But say Green, who does have the buy, is in the same boat. I would also start Steele if I saw, uh, sorry, Green, if he, if he had 17 points upside. So I just think it comes down to how many of those players you can reasonably find. Um, mm-hmm. But don't fool yourself because not many of these exist. Like even Walsh, predicting Walsh to go up 17 points is a pretty bold prediction. So yeah. don't kid yourself with how many of those act- actually exist. But I would be happy to start as many of them as I can find that have that much upside. Yeah. Uh, so that's the the quick answer because I just don't think it's more than one or two a buy. Like I just don't really think there's that that many um, like that. The second one, I guess, is within a buy. So you say you're looking at round two buy players. Uh, with the ones that we've got on screen, there's a concentration of mids in Neil, Dunkley, and Walsh. And yeah, I was talking about that, that 50 to 60 points you lose over a rookie. That gets exponentially worse each time. Not exponentially. It gets worse uh, each time you have another midfielder in the same line missing. Mm. So, And that is because the next rookie that comes on isn't as good as the one, probably the first one that you had sub on. And then the rookie that comes on after that isn't as good as again. So it might be that you lose 50 points for the first one, but then it's more like 60 and then it's like 70. And all of a sudden, it's a really big downside. And if you have someone else miss that week, then you've got forced trades on top of it as well. So there is, I guess, a theoretical cap any given week, which is that if you run out of bench rookies, it becomes really bad. Um, And that's the other thing to consider as part of this, because it's not just in the premiums you're looking at, but who else am I missing in that given week? What is the strength of my cover and all that type of stuff? Yeah, because that was the, like, another question. Like, does it matter, for example, if they're a premium or if they're a rookie? Um, and I guess the the extra risk, I suppose, that would be inbuilt in these players is: do you have sufficient players that you that you can have to cover? Because, for example, here yeah. with round in the round two buy, when you have got Carlton and and um, and the Brisbane Lions, you might start Sam Walsh because Sam Walsh presents so much value in terms of the upside mm. that he squats. Uh, but you might have someone like a Matt Roberts, for example, on the bench. Now he doesn't have the buy. Uh, but mm-hmm. he is—he could be playing half back for the Sydney Swans, which could be a really good role. And you might not be losing so much if you have the cover for him. Whereas if you don't have, whereas if you don't have that cover, for example, on the bench, you don't really have any good scoring options, and you're more likely to be losing out on those points on field. Because ultimately, mm-hmm. if you can't get the points scored on the field, then you're going to be falling behind the rest of the pack, and you're going to be um, really low ranked. Yeah, I, and just to answer your question, then, like, does it matter if they're premium or rookies? I think the answer is yes, because once again, the premium score that you're losing is like 110. The rookie score that you're losing, it might be the difference. If it's a slightly better rookie, it might be the difference between like a 60 and a 55 or something. So the point that you're losing is different. And the reason, like the role that the rookie is playing in your team is different anyway. It's to generate the most cash. And so if you're picking the rookies that are gener- going to generate the most cash, then yeah, it's it's fine. But once again, you do have to be careful because if you've got, say, Coleman and Williams both in your defense, um, then the two players that you're subbing on is your D7 and your D8. Now you've got no cover. And yes, it's best 18, um, but you are putting you know weaker uh, players on field the more that you have missing from the same buy. But if yeah. you saw enough value, I'm all for, like, go for it. Like, just chuck them, yeah. get them all in. Because if a rookie know, is taken off... I'm sorry, sorry, but go, just, just a quick one. Because if a rookie is... The one on the buy on field, and you're replacing it with another rookie. It's it's not you're not really giving up the points. But if you're mm-hmm. losing a premium and getting a rookie score off the bench, then obviously you are fielding a a, a much worse score. Go big, Jay. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I know I'm a lot more confident having like a Jeremy Sharp or one of our probably um, limited spot midfield rookies because I know there's probably not that many, or we're not picking as many this year as in previous years because we know they're going to score a lot more. So having someone miss out in that position versus like the forward line or the defense, as JD says, is um, probably a, a good strategy to have if you're going to have someone missing out because of the buy. Now, one thing, I guess, um, like like specifically to mention with the round two players, just because they're a little bit unique compared to the rest is they go on buy before they've had a price rise. So they have round mm-hmm. zero, which goes into their score, round one, which goes in the score. Then they go on buy and then they come off their buy and they have their round three game and then they have their first price rise um that round two buy coincides with when pretty much everyone else is on the bubble unless they played round zero and haven't had the buy yet which is just six teams um 
I told you, I get like oddly specific about this stuff and it's just bad, especially for a beginner <laughs> series. I'm sorry. The point that I'm trying to make though is these, the riskier ones in this tier, you can probably go without starting and correct to at the end of round two if you want to. Um, so yeah. even even someone like Sam Walsh, if you're um, like fairly hot on Sam Walsh, but you're not 100% sold and you've got someone else that you think you might like just as much, maybe like a steal that you mentioned, uh, you can always start steal and then correct steal to Walsh after Walsh's buy if you're still a believer. Um, I think Kitty Coleman mm -hmm. is a really good example of uh, that type of player or potential as well, where if you have a failed mid-price or new defense, like maybe you started a Chapman or a Burick or something like that. I think Coleman's only an extra 100K on those guys, and it might be someone that you could correct to um, after he comes off the round two buy. So that's the one caveat, but it's specific just to these round two players. Yeah, I guess like you're saying right as well, that you can just jump on them afterwards. If mm -hmm. Kitty Coleman comes out and says, you must pick me, I've dropped 120, 120. If they don't get me round three or four, like you're done for the year. Hey, presto, yeah. there's another... um scapegoat like we were talking about at the start of the episode yep exactly uh these next round these next buy round players uh the round three they would have had a price rise because they play in round zero and whilst round zero doesn't count for points it does count in the price cycle so they will have played round zero round one and round two so these players, when they go into their buy from the Suns and the Giants, they would have had one price change. Not necessarily going to be a price rise, depending on the player. It could also be a bit of a drop. But for all in, for our intensive purposes today, we're looking at the players who are most likely going to be having price rises because they are the relevant super coach scorers. Uh, I know that you sort of touched on this before, JD, and we sort of had it here, Pete, as an example that. Should you still go for the value players? So we had Sam Walsh, an example, and you said, yes, go for it. Tom Green, if he is in there, he's got an early buy, still go for it. Another one that's got a lot, a lot of value is Tuke Miller. Now, we obviously do get round zero to have a look and see what his role is like. Uh, but when it comes to selecting him, though, what would you want to see from your round zero players to entice you into picking them up after their buy? So it comes down to why you think the player is value to begin with and then trying to identify that thing. So, for example, uh, Miller fell off towards the back end of last year uh, after his injury um, and after they'd made some kind of adjustments within the Suns' midfield room. He played more of a defensive stopper, uh, almost tagging role at times, I would say, rather than what his natural game had been where he scored his best over those past few years. So in round zero, and even if you don't get him, but you might pick him up later. Uh, I'm looking for, you know, what CBAs does he get? Is it back up around that 80, 90% range that we'd seen him do his best work in? Is mm. his time on ground um, back at the levels that we expect from an endurance beast like Took? So once again, uh, I think in some of his best seasons, you're probably seeing that around the mid 80s, maybe even a little higher than that off the top of my head. Uh, that definitely dipped last year just because of injuries and then uh, his return from that. So yeah, where 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 do you actually see him at with those um, stats, CBAs, and both time and ground? So, uh, 2022 he averaged 120 super coach. He had 80% CBAs, 87% time on ground. 2023 he averaged 67% CBAs, so that's a 13% drop, and he had uh, time on ground of 82%, so dropped 5%. So I'd be looking for those types of indicators to go up and pairing that with an eye test. What's his role within the midfield? Is he playing a defensive role? Is he actually going back to being more of a ball winner and more of a leader in that midfield, where, where are they at? So, um, yeah, those those would be the types of things I'm looking for. It's not necessarily the score as much as is he hitting those time on ground CBA role milestones in, in Miller's case? Does he look injury-free, that that type of thing? Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about buy flipping primos a little bit later. We can talk about it now if you want, but um, GWS is one of those teams where they've got so, you know, they've got North Melbourne, in round one, yeah. and then West Coast Easy beats, round. am I right? Easy, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not sugarcoating. Like, we'll probably get smashed in, like, you know, they'll probably both smash both those games. So do you come into it with a feeling of maybe Tom Green is too expensive, but Kelly or Cornelio or someone else, could you get some quick early points on someone else and then look to upgrade after their first price rise or just in general? Yeah, so... I've Conceptually, I've, I've always struggled with buy flipping. Um, so in Supercoach historically, and look, we are changing away from the historical rules of the game, 
but mm. you don't tend to trade out players that miss one week of games. Like if they had a concussion or a suspension for a week, especially a suspension, you don't trade them out because they're not injured. Um, they're not at risk of losing the role or anything like that. They come back and just resume what they were doing previously. So you don't trade out these players. It's not worthwhile interrupting the rest of what you're doing just to, to move that around. In fantasy, as a FYI, some people do trade one-week injuries. I still don't think that's the right strategy. There may be some fringe cases where it is, but I, I just believe it's generally better to hold them. So in this year, we, we look at these bye weeks and what are they? They're a one-week rest, which I wouldn't normally trade for anyway. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but it's best 18 rather than uh, best 22. So the amount of points you lose for, for having them out is actually reduced. We talked about that 50 to 60, but when you bring in best 18, it's actually more like 30, 20 to 30, 30 mm -hmm. to 50, depending on your bench and a whole bunch of other factors. But uh, it's, it's less. It's less than what you would normally lose. So I would never trade someone um that's missing one week so starting someone to trade them when i wouldn't normally trade them in that situation just it doesn't pass the logic test yeah um, so that's kind of like one the second part is if you bring in tom green or even a kelly and kelly i think ended up having like zero percent cbas against the pies they put him more and more outside so he's probably off my list anyway um in the finals he sorry that that's the last game of the finals in the final series they dropped off his cba time again so probably just strike them off the list. But even like a Cogs, uh, who can be a bit of a vulture at times, beats up on North and West Coast. If he's averaging like 130 or 140 after those games, are you really trading him out? Like that's that's like what, what the discipline to pick up Tom Green, have him go 150, 150, and then go, no, I got to trade him out is nuts. The, uh, the other thing as well is, yes, he will have had a bit of a price rise, but given where he's starting at, it won't be that much. It might be 50K, which is still good. Don't get me wrong. I haven't run the numbers, but it's not it's not heaps and heaps. And he would still have such a large negative break even. You'd want to hold him for the cash gen. Plus, he just list like, I just don't get how you ever actually trade them. The only the only time you actually trade them is that they you started them, they did poorly, and then you trade them, in which case you just shouldn't have started them anyway. So it's either you start them because you think they're going to be good and you keep them, or you don't start them because you think they're going to be bad. I don't think there's a middle ground where you start them to buy flip. The last point on this is, um, yep. and comes again into philosophy, this um, early part of the year, you should be trying to maximize how much value or cash your team creates so that you can end up getting all the expensive players you want as quickly as you can sideways swapping players like this is using a trade to get a little bit of extra points for not much extra value. I could be better using that trade to fix up rookies or get on mid prices that are doing well or a bunch of other things. So to earmark a trade um, for points maximizing rather than like cash maximizing at this time of the year also doesn't really seem to make sense for me. So um, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of it. I'm sure there are cert certain situations where in hindsight, we could say like, oh, it would have worked really well for this player with this situation this year, but I, it's not something I think on average is going to work out well for people to try and do it. Mm. Oh, and one last point. We are like, we're, we're so focused on like round three buys that we aren't thinking about what round 12, 13, 14, 15 buys. From the last two years, people are out of trades by that point of getting very close to it. And they end up yeah. copying zeros or only fielding 17 in those buy rounds because they don't have enough. Why would mm -hmm. I use that trade here when I could use it later on and maybe save myself 100 points rather than 50? Yeah. Like it's, yeah, I just, I, there's no way that I see this being good. I, I, as I said, I'm sure there will be fringe situations in hindsight where we say like, yeah, that, that worked out well for that person. But I think on average, you're going to hurt yourself more often than you're going to win, win Supercoach because of it. Mm. Oh, very smart there. Yeah, the exceptions aren't, you're not supposed to use just single anecdotal experiences, for example, to to toss out the entire, the general rule, I suppose, because it is a long season, as you say, and ultimately it's, uh, yes, we have extra trades, but just because you have extra trades doesn't necessarily mean it gives you the green light to go absolutely ham and spend them early. I know a lot of players, myself included last year, we had extra trades and yet, I still was stuck with mm -hmm. some injured premium on the bench. I still was stuck with Nick Dacos. I still was stuck with Jordan Ridley on my bench. I had these two premiums mm -hmm. sitting there at you know at D7 and D8 and really couldn't do anything about it. So I know it seems like we've got a lot of trades in terms of 40, but don't underestimate because I've said this before, just because you finish your team, it doesn't necessarily mean that the game is over. There's still 
around half a season left after you're done with upgrading your team and various issues can arise. It's a long season that's gotten even longer. Uh, model of the story, don't flip your buyer premiums. All those Nick Dacos people are just like, cool, I'll get Nick Dacos and then flip him or, or do whatever. Probably not the best idea is what we're hearing. Yeah, exactly. We then move to the next buy. Now, round four. I love it how you talked about Nick Dacos because in we come, round five, it's Nick Dacos. Uh, now, he's on a lot of people's lip. <laughs> great yeah, segue. Love great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, whether it's here or on Fancast, but um, we need we need you on Fancast, JD, this coming season. It's, it's got to happen. Yeah, it is the plan. It's Mel. Oh, I shouldn't shouldn't leak where the location is, but yes, when I'm down, there is uh plans to at least try and do something in person for sure. Excellent. But yes, we're talking about Nick Dacost in here with Collingwood. Obviously, there's a Sydney players as well. Some I think a lot of people are gonna have. Grundy, and just by virtue of the position and the value he, he poses, uh, a lot of people are willing to to accept that risk. But there's a few, quite a few people who are uh, not thinking about starting Nick Dacos because of this buy coming off of the potential or very likely Finn tag coming out from the Hawks. Uh, are you one of those players as well, JD? Uh, surprisingly not. So... <laughs> I'm I'm usually uh, I, I like taking on the top price players in most lines because I think you, they tend to regress on average. They don't usually back it up. Uh, I think Dacos is probably going to be the exception to that this year, where even at his one sixteen um, price, he's got some value baked in just because of that Hawks injury game. I think without that, he was averaging one twenty, so that's four points upside. He's uh, you know with where he's at in his career, I still think there's there's more upside in terms of his national development. He feels like he could be truly one of like the top five players for actually probably the top player in the league for many years to come um, the mm, way he's yeah. trended so far. So yeah, I, I don't believe it's unrealistic for him to go to like a 125 plus this year, which at his starting price would make him, yeah, a really, really, really strong pick. Um, uh, both because you get him at a discount and, and he might end up pricing out other people. Now, with that said, what are the reasons why people are off him? And I think it's twofold. So one, it's because of the buy. Don't want to have a player in that buy round, especially where a lot of people have Grundy. So you're starting to double up players in the same buy, which people are, are, are very wary of. Mm -hmm. But secondly, he's got the Hawks match up the game before where he's going to potentially get the Finn McGuinness tag. And so it's more, I think, that people are scared of him because of, of these combining factors, which is that if he gets tagged, his average won't actually be that good over the first five weeks. Then he'll drop a little bit in price and I can pick him up. Um, kind of as my upgrade season starts. And if that turns out uh, to be true, then I think people that uh, decide to fade him will end up doing really well. If he instead goes 135 average, which I think is what he did over the first six games last year and prices mm -hmm. them out really badly, then uh, I think you're laughing. Like it doesn't really matter that he has one buy that he misses because he ended up being priced so well anyway. So I, on the Finn McGuinness stuff, it's a little bit interesting because coaches don't tend to tag as early on in the year. I think Dacos mm -hmm. probably might be an exception, especially given that the Finn McGuinness tag worked well last year. It happened in the preseason, JD. It they did. tagged it him did. in a practice it game. Did. It did. It did. Uh, I So I think there's a chance that Finn isn't best 22 this year or best 23, but there's equally a chance that they bring him just for that game anyway as a Correct. tagging specialist. I, I also think that Pies will be ready for the tag this time around. I mean, Dacos surely has got to be expecting he's getting more attention this year. And I think sure. as a club, they're probably training ways to mitigate that, including dropping him back into defense, which well, I think we've already seen preseason footage of him taking kick-ins, which is interesting given that he wasn't really doing that over the back end of the year. Post by, he only had four from seven games, including his injury one. So yeah, uh, I don't know. I... I, I I still think there's upside in him. So I'm I'm at the moment I'm probably more likely to start him than not. But it also comes yeah. down to how confident I am in the other premium defenders, and I don't really like um, some of the other options at the moment. I can see regression in them as well, which is probably not popular opinion, especially amongst better coaches. I think they still kind of see upside or stability in the likes of Stuart Sicily Sinclair. 
Uh, and if that's true, I can see why they'd want to pick them and take on Dacos, where I probably lean more the other way at the moment. Still time to change that opinion, though. Pick all three. Just go ham. Backline, that's it. Go for it. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Or you could have Dacos in the midfield, perhaps. But mm. uh, if you do that and you've got Matt Roberts sitting on the bench, unfortunately, Matt Roberts won't be able to help you out this round because he would be on the buy. I think he'd be relying on the likes of a Jeremy Sharp, perhaps. Uh, if he's playing. So in this case, you will be replacing an Uber premium, potentially even M1, if <laughs> if what JD predicts comes mm. to pass, seeing over a 120 average this year. Not, we're not just talking D1. This could be pushing M1 status this year. And if you're g- losing him and you're going to be substituting a rookie on the field, that's a question, I suppose, that you have to consider whether or not that's a play you want to go. Do you want to go a bit heavier, for example, with an extra premium in the midfield to sort of maybe try a sort of um, and balance that out? But mm. these are all. There's no right way. I think is the the general consensus at this point. It's you build your team with the value and the upside that you think that your players pose because this is the first time we've had so many buyers with this staggered approach. And if you decide to fade Nick Dacos, then you're really pr- you're really praying for a fin mag tag. Uh, in round in round four, that's for sure. Yeah, I think for me, the Nick Dacos is definitely one of those pigs on field that every time he gets the ball, I'm going to curse that he's not in my team. And I just hope that he's not going to get touched. So it was Sicily last year, it was Petrarca, you know, um, Zach Butters towards the end of the season when he went out with monster numbers. Nick Dacos, every time he gets a kick in or anything, Dacos, why are you not in my side? I just uh, yeah. like one fun fact to leave you with Dacos. Uh, do you want to guess what his average was in games where he had 70% or more CBAs? Uh, 70% or more CBAs. There was only three games, to be fair, so it's a small, smaller sample size. 110. That's the truth. I was about to say 110. <laughs> All right, fine. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say one, I'll say 140. 134. So yeah, oh. it was, it was big. There's some, some positive signs there. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. High CBAs and kick-ins if he's tagged. This is just ridiculous stuff. Um, I know some people are looking to start Errol Goulden because of how incredible of a performance he had last year. And I think he's coming, he's upstarting his first four games of the season. He performed really well against them in the back end last year as well. I think he averaged around 140 uh, all up against in his first four games. Are you, is he someone that you're looking to consider, perhaps? So, very interestingly, I did the coaches panel episode on Errol Goulden, and I <laughs> believe I was I was the first one to drop that that fixture stat that his average mm-hmm. against those teams was insane. So, it's good to see that it's catching on. I was trying to find any reason to pump up the Errol Goulden tires to start him. Love him as a player. Can't see him as someone that I would start because from this buy, I, I like Dacos more. Um, and I could see mm-hmm. myself looking at, you know, Jordan, potentially even Adam, some of these other, and we've got Grundy as well. So uh, I find it unlikely that I probably have room for Goulden. I think the other um, thing that sticks out to me as well is he is more outside than a lot of the other top premium midfielders that we have. These outside mm-hmm. players with lower CBAs tend to have more variants attached to them. So yes, Goulden has the potential to go 150 plus, And I think he did that in four games last year. But he also had a sub-51 week and he had two others that were in the 60s as well. So it's the type of player that I can wait until he has a bad game and then for his price to come down and then pick him off at that point. And that's what I'll be trying to do this year and then ride him through some of the good matchups. See? see? I, I, I follow your content, JD. I follow your work. I, I, I see, I, see, I, see I, I do my best to, to alley-oop you, mate, as much as I can. All right. Oh, we then move thank you. Thank you. To the next. You're welcome. Anytime, anytime, fellow Dons. All right. Uh, we moved to round six. Again, very, very popular selections. I think Max Gorn, we've seen the value that he presents. Uh, and many people are looking to start him. Petrarca, obviously, with the news of Clayton Oliver being out, um, perhaps for the first half of the season, according to some. Mm-hmm. Whether or not that actually happens or not is a different story. Um, and obviously, we've got a mid pricer of Billings as well. So, these guys are probably all a lot more relevant than the Richmond guys, to be completely honest with you. Um, do you have two of these, one of these, three of these? 
Uh, on the screen, I currently have two. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I've got Gorn. No, wait, no, no. I've got one. I've, I think I've just got Billings. Um, okay. so oh, yeah, no Max Gorn. No Max yeah, Gorn. no Max Gorn. I've 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 been a big Jerry fan the whole whole preseason. You know that, Jay. Big big Jerry oh. boy. Why are you shaking your head? It's such a trap. It's such a trap. It's a North oh. boy. You're not Jeez. happy that an Essendon supporter has got a North boy in their team? Come on, man. Yeah, but um, if I was an Essendon supporter, I know Sam Draper's probably not a good super coach pick, even if he does play yeah, solo. I, 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 so, I would, like, I would the, the upside you. doesn't matter if you go for the team, right? Uh, no, I, I I like Gorn as an option. So when I've had enough cash, I've put Cherry up to Gorn a fair bit. Um, but if I need the extra money to fiddle around with some structure, then that's where I tend to free it up from at the mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. Uh, just because I don't think there's that much of a gap. I, I think I can find you know value elsewhere. Um, yeah, Billings, I, I like as a prospect. I know many have talked about it, but when he was at his best, what, a couple of years ago now, and I do worry the further we get removed from someone's best. But he was up in the 90s, and given the weak forward line this year, he seems like someone that could, you know, uh, strive in a, in a strong D's midfield. So, um, yeah, I'm, I like Billings as an option. We'll just see what happens with the preseason. He's, he's priced pretty cheaply, like in the 50s or something like that. So uh, should be able to outperform that by... 25, 30, 35 points pretty easily uh, if all goes well. Petrarca is the interesting one if Oliver is out for an extended period of time because he's scoring with and without Oliver was very interesting last year. I'll mm. bring it up as we speak, but I believe it was... Uh, one, how, 129 I think I think it was 124 without Oliver and 116 mm-hmm. with him. If, uh, yes. if uh, it was eight yes, points. I think that sounds right, yeah. So... Yeah, obviously very strong numbers. I, I do worry that, once again, um, Pashraka was a little bit like uh, Goulden in the sense that his CBA has dropped, especially over the second half of the year. So I think over the last like 10, 10 weeks, he only had 57% CBAs. A lot of top mids we see more up in the 70 to 80% range. Um, so I worry about that. He he outperformed his role by so much last year. It was unbelievable. Uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, that's... he's. On the watch list for sure, especially if I'm, yeah. I lose faith in other mid options. Tigers, I'm pretty yeah. much all out on. I know there was some news yeah. today that Short is going back to the half back flank role, and he's best in that role was good enough. So I might have another look at him. But with the early buy, um, once again, it's that negative value built in. I think the upside that he may have at his price is offset enough by that that it's probably someone I'm happy to wait and see on if I've got yeah. enough other defender options that I like. Uh, Dusty, I know they're talking about how good he is, and I can definitely buy into reasons why Uze would want to put him in the midfield and have a really good, strong start to the year. You know, put your best assets out there in the best positions to do that. I'm not entirely sure that he um, recaptures some of that old form, and I think there's durability concerns about where Dusty's at in this in his part yeah. of his career. And then Baker, I really like. He's actually one of my favorite favorite Tigers. Actually, yeah, probably one of my favorite non Essen players. I really like Baker. Uh, I still worry that they move him around too much. He's too much of a Mr. Fix-It to settle in a role that he'll actually score well in. And I think the latest reports have been that he's half forward where really it'd either be on ball or or right. at a half back where he'd do his best work. Um, just quickly, other players worth mentioning um, from these sides, like probably um, Trisice is yep. the Tigers yep. that name that people should have on the watch list that people have been um, talking about a little bit. He's 208K, could get a role as a kind of like medium defender yeah. uh, and then yeah I like I know we're not going into in depth with all these things but Marty Hoare for the D's is um, obviously the other one now the interesting thing about these and why I bring them up is um, when you get to round five those players will have had one more price rise than every other player um, in the competition yeah. because they've either had a round zero by a round two round three or round five by these are the only players that have just had straight five games of um, footy and they've got an extra price rise in the system so yeah. starting some of the cheaper ones here, either the rookies on the mid prices might be beneficial because they, with that extra price rise, will have made a bit more money and you can then sell them before their buy to start upgrading a little bit earlier than you otherwise would have been able to. Um, so one one to, one thing to keep an eye on, like it, it could be a little bit of a tiebreaker situation for me where I'm not, maybe I'm not sure about whether Billings or Harms will be better, but knowing Billings has an extra price rise up until this point, it might edge me his his direction. Mm. I was uh, Tom that. Lynch was the same for me as well, barring um all these injury yeah. woes yeah. and not playing round zero now. So yeah, if he was playing fit and firing, get in my team, offload you round six, and potentially grab someone who's starting to fall in cash pretty hard or set to get DPP as well. 
Yeah, and there's also Caleb Windsor, I think, for who's gained a lot of traction as well. Uh, over in, in recent times, obviously, the footage came out from the Melbourne uh, Football Club socials. He looked really good and really a go-getter. And then, obviously, even have Petrarca follow up and tell everybody uh, who plays Supercoach. He literally name-dropped Supercoach. He's telling everyone to, to start <laughs> Caleb Windsor. So, you know, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Hey, Joe, Big J, do you reckon there's a chance he gets you on for a collab TikTok, maybe a Supercoach <laughs> cooking crossover? Mate, we're in. Done. Just he, give us the details. We're set. I'll, I'll, I'll tell him to reach out to your people. His people will get in contact with your people and we'll tee something up. My yeah, grandma I'll, has taught me very well. I can teach him a thing. I can teach him a thing or two. It's all right. <laughs> no, 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 no. Get in there. Um, yeah, no, Windsor, Windsor is an interesting one. I, I, I do. Yeah, I've got an eye on him too. We'll see how he goes. Once again, though, and this is the disappointing part, We'll just see in round zero. I don't need to think about these rookies too hard. I don't need to think about those Tiger players too hard, right? We'll just mm-hmm. see in round zero. Whatever, man. Like, yeah. Exactly. Cool. If they're yeah, scheduled to make cash, chuck them in your team. That's it. Yeah. Well, we get to round 12. So we finally have a big jump. We, we move, yeah. we jump forward into the season. We get to almost the halfway point where North Melbourne finally has their buy. Obviously, we're not going to mm-hmm. show the players that you've already seen from those other three teams, but... I think we're seeing a lot of uh, selections from North Melbourne in early days, Big J. Yeah, it's definitely similar to this one. And then round 13, I think it is where Port and um, Frio play, where people are really taking advantage of only four teams. And you don't have to fill up your team full of like Lions and Giants and Sydney players. But I think there's some real advantage to kind of, cool, taking two or three from this, starting those because you, you don't have to upgrade them later on. And then having them play, you know, the next three buy rounds. It's a pretty good strategy, I think. Yeah, because the Lions, the Giants, and the cherry. Swans, they're now having no, except cherry. cherry. No cherry, huh? No because cherry, the Lions, no. the Giants, and the Swans, this is their second buy by this mm. point in time. So they, we've missed one game for you, and now they're missing a second game. Whereas North Melbourne, this is their first time having a buy. And there's a reason why a bunch of players are starting some of these really exciting North players. Um, because you're going to have 11 or 10 consecutive games uh, yeah. from these players starting from round one onwards. So it's – and with the 40 with the forty trades, it makes sense it's to start some injury-prone players. Yeah, I was going to say, it's what we covered in our beginner video with DR was like you start the risks if you can. And, you know, an LDU, yeah. for example, has had some injury worries in the past. So start him instead of upgrading into the pick. Yep, Exactly. Uh, we then move to round 13, as you alluded, Big J. Only the two teams, and that's why JD flagged that this is probably the best buy for you to aim to have players because it is best 18, and you've only got two teams missing. Yeah, spot on. No notes required. I, I, I think you're, uh, <laughs> you're correct. Uh, and to be honest, I wasn't the first one to cotton on to this. I think a lot of people, as soon as they started to cast their eye towards that um, round 12 mm. to 15, by week they said, oh, there's a there's a buy with just two teams on it. That's a good one to target. And given that neither of these teams have round zero buys, the yeah, absolutely. Well, sorry, um, like an early buy that yeah, um, yeah. yeah, these are these are the best ones to target. I think in terms of like buy round ratings, it's got like my top rating on basically everything. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I've got no problems loading up on on players from these sides as as long as you like them. I think. Young's been in my sides all preseason. Brayshaw's been in there for most of it, and Butters, I think, has been in there since day one as well. So yeah. uh, I, I probably don't want to add too many more just because I still want some targets coming out of the buy maybe. But, yeah, they, yeah, it's a great buy to pick players, and if you see good value, then they go for it. Yeah, I was going to ask how many is too many because I've seen some teams that, I mean, these are the best ones out of the sides, but I've seen some teams with four, five, and six of these players in there. And then Luke Ryan on top of it as well. And I'm like, Mate, how, how many is too many, JD? I can't believe you said these are the best ones and Sean Darcy's not in there. My boy, oh, Shrek. And, oh. then, and then you even mentioned Puke Ryan before him. Just, oh, <laughs> big mate, daddy. You're committing yeah, yeah, all expect. the sins. Gorn and Grundy's locked in for the season, mate. I don't need to worry about Shrek. I would have mate, preferred you... us talk about Fife over, um, that's true. <laughs> over, over that, bloody Ryan. That's true. They um, have to survive to get to this point, JD. They have, Fife has to survive to get to round 13. <laughs> Direct ask to get the round. Uh, yes, yeah, very good, very good. Um, 
Actually, Luke Jackson could be relevant than the Shrek. Uh, exactly. Freo has Freer, got a lot of players that are quite interesting this year. And, uh, you know, they've got Chapman and stuff as well. you got Sharp as a rookie. They've got a lot going on. Uh, Port, you've also got Sweet as a little bit of a... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. R3. Something, something. Uh, yep. Yeah. So to answer your question, how many of these is too many? I, I Like, I would struggle to see people loading up on all six. But if you had, like, all four of the midfielders here in... Brayshaw, Sarong, uh, Rosie, and Butters, you've probably done it wrong. So I, I think that's, that's you know, maybe two or three of those is probably the cap. And then, you know, if you had both Hayden and Houston, it's fine. But if you had Hayden, Houston, and Ryan, once again, you've probably gone a little bit too far. Like, you could, but I think you want to keep one of these as an option to upgrade to after that buy anyway. So, yeah, I'd, yep. you know, yep. And if you lock them in early, you're really hoping that they are top eight to ten as well. Like, um it's always it's always good to leave some room in your back in your in your midfield to target the players that are clearly looking to be top of the line. Obviously, you can't nail everybody, but mm-hmm. if you're getting if you're if you're filling in a bunch of cheaper premiums, you might and you end up keeping them for the whole year. You might be sacrificing in total uh, points on field. So that's why you got to yep. keep keep some spots available, not just about the buyers. Uh, round 14 is a really busy one. Uh, we finally feature in there, as do the Cats and the Eagles. Very hard to find premiums from the Eagles. Uh, Harley Reid could be one if he's playing uh, half back over there. I think Witherden and Duggan, you know, if they can stay healthy and get back mm-hmm. and playing for full fitness, then obviously they're pretty, they could be relevant. They're going to, then God knows they're going to get a lot of supply back there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do love that Reed starts out this list, though. Uh, he probably is the most likely to be a premium keeper of, of, of <laughs> West Coast Eagles. Listen, I mean, if he's playing that cheese role in a week forward line this year, why couldn't he mm-hmm. go 90 plus and be a keeper? I, I think that's like reasonable. I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Witherden's probably the, the only other interesting one there. Duggan doesn't do much for me, but yeah, Witherden, maybe there's enough upside at his price, but it's probably more fantasy than super coach. Um, True. Cats jump down to them. I mean, I like Tom Stewart as a pick. It's probably one of the defenders I'd try and find ways to get in. Um, Guthrie is interesting from the value perspective. Uh, yep. I think there's enough other options that I like that push Guthrie out of contention, but there is a bit of a log jam in that 400 to 500k mark, including the likes of him, uh, Crouch, Nick um, Martin, Nick Martin on the screen right there. I was, Trying to end with Nick Martin, but there's no, some. No, uh, uh, Carl I can't. Amon. Like, I Carl love Nick Amon, And of course, most importantly, segue Nick Martin. And that brings us to the most important team on the round 14 buys, the Mighty Essen and Bombers. Yes, um, yes. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Nick Martin, someone that is in my side, he's been in my side for over a week mm-hmm. now, and I'm very disappointed that others are starting to cotton on. Uh, the reports have been good. Merritt and Parrish, I don't really see your starting options, but, um, you know, Merritt, the, it's around this time of the year usually that we're actually upgrading Merritt on the cheap and he carries us on the way home. So I'll be be tagging him around now. Yeah, pretty much, right? Um, moving into round 15, Joe, I have mm-hmm. a bit of a question for you. Um, with so many players featuring in this buy round, JD, do you aim to, like, when you make your starting team, I know we've talked about trades and things like that, do you aim to keep these players for the whole year? Or are you like, cool, I'll start who I want, and then because I've saved my trades, I haven't done premium buy swapping or swapping at the start of the season. I'm okay to swap maybe a, an English or a Caleb Daniel, whoever it is, out, and then get someone else who's already had their buy come round 15? Because there's a lot of teams. Like, six teams it is a lot. Mm, it is. Joe, what do you think? Uh, I want to hear you first. The question was posed to you, JD. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so can can you start them to to swap them out? I think you can. Um, this does tend to be what we've seen in the last couple of years work, which is that if you have um, extra round 15 buy premium, swapping them out to someone that you like more for the run home makes sense. So if you start a little bit too many of these and they underperform a bit, it makes sense to sideways them at this buy. Uh, and part of the reason saying like don't use those sideways trades early on like the this is when you you might be wanting to use them um mm-hmm. and the other thing is like you can't upgrade to these players before this and it makes sense given that they still have the buy there's always someone else coming off the buy that you'd rather target 
So okay. if you do really like players off these buys, uh, yeah, tending to like start them or get them early makes sense. And then you just trade out the underperformers at the buy. It, the problem always is what if there's no underperformers? But um, yeah, I can see a few from this list that I'm pretty sure will underperform. Yeah, no, I think there's always underperformers. There's always fallen premiums. It is a long, it's a long season. Someone might have got concussed um, and had to be subbed out early or something. You know mm. what I mean? Like there's, there's always a bunch of things that could happen on a footy field. I know there's been a lot of love for Jai Newcomb, um, especially coming out of the Hawks, who, you know, yeah, another year of progression, sure, but I just can't see him matching any of the top dogs. And I wouldn't mm-hmm. be surprised if a lot of people who start him get to this point and, you know, if they haven't traded him out already, sort of realise that, yeah, this guy ain't going to cut the mustard anymore and might feel like, you know, now's the time, for example, to jump on, I don't know, maybe a Rory Laird or, or a Dawson. Maybe Dawson's been tagged out of a game here and there um, because he's so vital. Someone's tagged him and then he can drop in price a little bit and then you might jump from from Newcomb to Dawson and overall you'd improve the, the overall strength of your team. But ultimately, yeah, as, as JD says, I'm, I'm not a big fan of trading out my premiums. By this point of the season, if you haven't, it might be a good time for Matt Crouch. Uh, I know I know um, George, shout out to George as well from Fantasy Tech TV. He featured on DR's channel talking about the Adelaide Crows, and he said that Crouch, Matt Crouch, is probably going to be a buy flip at this point. And I don't, and I don't think that's a problem. If you're, if you're paying up 490 for him, hopefully he made you some good cash come this point. Um, and then you can get him to flip to an Uber premium. So I think that's a successful starting selection. Yeah, I think people are going to probably offload Jack Steele by this point as well, if they still had him. I, th- I, I wouldn't be thinking him, you're like picking him as a keeper. But uh, what before we jump off these, I'm curious, like who is the, of the, what twelve players on the screen? Who are you most likely to pick, and who are you least likely to pick as a starting selection? You want to go first, Joe, or do you want me to go? Man, everyone's offering me to talk. I, I normally think I talk a lot, but I guess guess not. All right. Uh, from the Crows, I'm most likely. No, I meant to... of all twelve, not yeah. of oh, just pick two okay. players, not not every team. We don't want you. We could, do, we, could do, we could do every team. Yeah, every team is fun too. But yeah, the Bond, the Bond is my selection. He's my okay. per, perma captain, and he's been in my side all preseason, just about. So the Bond is well and truly in my team with the C on him. And who's your not picking from this list? I am not picking Caleb Daniel. Hmm. Okay, Big J. I'm yeah, gonna force fair. you. I'm gonna force you to go uniques as well. So okay, so I can't pick the bond because I sh- I should have gone first and said the bond because bond's okay. in my team. Right. Um, cheers, mate. No, no, no. Uh, if if I've got to go, um, it's Sicily. Uh, he hurt me so much last year not having him at all. Every single game, every single intercept, like pulling my hair out. Hey, Sicily, just like, just stop, please. Um, yeah, he's definitely my my pick player. Um, who would I not pick? a real tricky one because I I look at St Kilda and I'm just not sure where they're at Uh, probably I'm tossing up between Jack Steele and Crouch so maybe maybe, uh, depending on form probably Crouch is definitely a no for me. Okay so my most likely to start of these is Matt Crouch it's the only one that's currently (laughs) in my side (laughs) and my least likely is probably Marshall, not because I don't think he'll be a good player across the year, but just because mm. there's enough value um, players that I'd, I'd take over him. Um, I can't see me picking him over any of Grundy, Cherry, gone. And even if all those went away, they've probably got English I'd rather fall back on. So, yeah. I Caleb Daniels on my never again list. I started him. He like, would be my easy number one. Like, hey, like yes. yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> looking at this list, I'm like, there is an odd man out. <laughs> He's sitting in the bottom right. One does not belong. I'm, I'm telling Big J, why do you have him and not Jack McRae on this list? Just, like, I don't know why. Just, Jack McRae's the burn man, at least. Caleb Daniel, there's something to talk oh, about, right? Caleb Daniel like, killed me so much worse uh, last year. And even Libra, I traded him in for the last couple of weeks and I, he got concussed as well. Like, that was, mm-hmm. oh, that cost me top 100, I reckon. Oh. 
Oh, I, I hope Jack McRae is um, F6 for half, like, for, for a quarter of the season last year, and it just didn't work out for me. So I'm not saying never again, but never again for right now. Uh, yeah, I that covers that, all of the slides. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, JD, kind of let's go early buys. We'll separate the two, early buys and late buys. Um, are there any players that you're aiming to bring in? So let's look at the early buys. I know Joe and I have talked about a couple. Have you done any of that research early and said, hey, you know, round six, seven, eight, maybe because of fixture or just you don't like them to start that, that you're looking to bring in? Uh, it's, a, it's a weird one. There's a Tiger, and I cannot remember who it is that's suspended for the first couple of weeks. Uh, Swansea. Tyler Swansea. yeah, that's rookie yeah. price, but has been talked up heavily. And I think he comes in, like, by the time he returns from suspension, comes in, Tigers mm. have their buy, he gets on the bubble. I think that's like a weird round, like round five or eight. So probably him. He's probably top of the list. Mm. I, I think for the others, it's hard because when you're coming off the round two and three buys... Uh, it's too early to be upgrading to premium. So you're not right. really targeting any of those. If there's rookies or mid prices that I miss, like say Kitty Coleman looks like he's going to be a top six defender. I'll find a way to force him in. Uh, but yeah, for the premiums, it's it's probably hard to see that happening. Uh, after round five and six, that is when we start to get into upgrade season. So I could reasonably see people starting to target some of those. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, Goulden is probably one where if he's, had a poor game. Um, I could see myself getting on him earlier rather than later. But mm -hmm. I will say, like, there are, like, the problem with the Swans is not only do they have that round five buy, they've got the round 12 buy, so the first of the mid-season buys. So really, you only have him for five or six weeks before he goes on another buy, in which case I'm probably better to pick him up after that point. Um, yeah. The ones that end up having better mid-round buys are the Tigers, but I don't really see any premiums in them. Uh, the D's, so, you know, potentially uh, I, I can't see myself, oh, maybe I could see myself picking up Gorn um, from a cherry at that point, uh, depending on where he's at or whether what the other rocks look like. Um, Oliver and Petrarca would be the ones that you'd be thinking about at that point, depending on how Clary's returned and all that type of stuff. Uh, maybe even Trent Rivers, if he looks like he's actually going to be a premium defender at that point. Um, if you didn't have Dacos and pick him up off the pies, but I think that'll be a priority because if he has been tagged, or even if he hasn't been tagged, I feel like that's when you're going to have to try and force me into your side. But really, there's no one else from the Pies that's putting their hand up to be a, a premium. Uh, no. And then, yeah, we touched on the Swan. So, like, no, not not really. Um, the the Carlton Suns lines in GWS, there's a fair few premiums that are interesting in there that we've touched on, whether it be Dunkley, Neil, Green, Cogs, Kelly. Um, uh, the Blues have got a bunch as well. Like, um, yeah, those ones I could see being part of the early upgrade. But once again, um, the Swans, Lions and Giants all have that early round 12 buy as well. So I, I probably, yeah, there's no, to answer the original question, I've waffled a bit. Um, there's no one I'm specifically targeting coming off those early buys. If I didn't start Dacos, I'd be targeting him, I guess. But that's probably part of the reason why I think I want to start him just because like it is the clear target to have. Yeah. Yeah. I guess opportunity as well. Like if someone's got concussed early and then they drop to their lowest price and then had their buy, like, hey, jump on me because I'm not going to be yep. cheaper at any other point. Of course, yeah. yeah. I think, I'm thinking perhaps it's not a problem starting a Tom Green type, who I think is going to be a top eight mid. And it's going to be really hard, as you say, JD, to really get them up to, to upgrade to him in round four yeah. of him coming off his buy. It's still a bit too premature. Um <laughs> So if I want a top eight mid like him, who I think is going to be a top eight mid, I might as well just start him. Hopefully he goes big against North and West Coast. I know he didn't go big last year against them, but um, there was a patch last year where he sort of dipped a little bit. Hopefully he can start the season hot, maybe go really well against them and then just lock myself in with that top eight mid um, and then hope that Finn McGuinness tags a living daylights out of day costs in round four so that I can sort of pick him up after his buy. So I think I, I've been floating around with picking one of these early buyer players because I am thinking long-term. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have too many Brisbane players who are primos. I don't think I'm going to have too many North primos. And I don't think I'm going to have too many Swan primo either. Uh, either. So the round 12 buy round doesn't appear to be too dangerous, I think, for the types of players that I want in my team. And so I'm thinking more as this is, as this preseason goes on that I might start a Tom Green type and hold him for the whole year rather than try and 
upgrade into all these players because at the end of the day, there's only so much money that you can make really quickly early on. Um, and really trying to stack up as a good point that you raised about the Melbourne and Richmond rookies that they would have had an extra price rise. So that's why the Windsors, Trezice, um, Gipkis, even uh, McAuliffe, if he gets a if he gets a call up, apparently he's done really well. The one seventeen k rookie in the midfield. So I think these guys could be really exciting. Not not for the points that they give you on field, but more so for the extra cash. Yeah, no, very very smart there. Kind of just risk reward and being like, well, I want to have these guys in my team as long as I can. If I pick them up and then five weeks later they missed a game, like why don't I not just start them? Exactly. Man, we thought this was going to go for half an hour, Big J. I know. Just we get talking. It's the buy rounds. We've got an expert on here and, hey, we can talk. Stop using that word. He doesn't like it, man. Stop it. Who doesn't love the buy rounds? Everyone's favorite topic. (laughs) I'll be very glad when we're past them. 100%. Massive thanks to you, JD, for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Uh, You are... You are one of those guys who are so good at downplaying the things that you have mm-hmm. to say. A true, a true bomber through and through. Uh, where can all of our wonderful viewers and subscribers find you? Uh, if you want to mm-hmm. listen to me at YouTube, you can find me at Jackson Davy. I think, um, or like, yeah, if you search my name, you'll find me uh, on Twitter. It's at Jackson Davy as well. Um, like, yep, yep. Let's try and keep it pretty simple. Uh, and then, of course, you will see me occasionally on um, the Fantasy Tech TV podcast, which is on Spotify and I'm sure a whole bunch of others, uh, and is also hosted on George's YouTube channel, which is uh, FTT George's or Supercoach George. Or something. If you search one of those, you'll find it. It'll be fine. <laughs> Have you exactly. got um, anything big coming out that the fans should like keep an eye out for? You got big plans for the preseason? Uh... I'm still trying to figure out what what will keep me interested in the preseason. Um, so uh, I know you've already spoken to him, but um, Jaden Popowski, like I'm keen to pick his brain about some of what he's found over the preseason. Um, that's probably the the big one on my mind of how I get the most out of time with him. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I'm not sure what I'll jump into next. If you've got any, any ideas, let me know. We'll do, man. We'll do anytime. We love we love to please because uh, here at the Center Bounce, we do the hard works that uh, you don't have to. Uh, so make sure you guys, you chuck us a subscription. You head on over to Jackson Davey as well as Fantasy Take TV and chuck them a subscription. I, I, I have no idea how you wouldn't have if you're watching this video already. Um, and make sure you hit the notification bell on both or all three of those channels to make sure that you don't miss ding, out ding. on any of the content. Correct? Ding, ding. Guys, remember, we've got our Super Coach League running this year as well. We've got three amazing prizes. You guys can win a jersey, a couple of tickets to an AFL game, and a voucher for AFL as well. So we'll put the link down to the, you know, to the competition video down in the description. Yep. And we're going to be going through all of the team previews. We're going to be pumping them out. They're not going to be long, I promise. There's going to be some short-form content coming up very, very soon for you. So make sure you check those out before the Pracky Games Sunday week. Very exciting. Uh, and make sure you stay tuned to all of our channels. Football's coming. It's like a month from now almost, and footy's back. I'm, I'm excited, and hopefully you guys are too. Thanks again, JD, and thanks to everybody out there. We'll see you all in the next one.